The concept of fuel is part of our living since the discovery of fire, and in modern life it is more important than ever, allowing planes to fly, cars to drive, and powering all sorts of machinery. Yet, very often, the way they work is ignored. Take the following questions, for example. What makes a fuel better than others? Is jet fuel more powerful than regular car fuel? Can the fuel in a tank explode? And if so, why don't we use them in place of explosives? What's the difference between a fuel and an explosive? And what about propellants? Are they the same as explosives? Or fuels. Even if you ask these to a lot of people, very likely you won't get a conclusive answer to any of them. Yet, there is a very elegant and simple explanation that can not only make you able to answer all of those questions, but also understand the true essence of fuels, explosives and propellants. No matter if you're interested in engines, rockets, firearms or explosives, these guides still relate to you, since the underlying phenomena are the same. Whatever your knowledge background is, what you're about to learn is a perfectly fitting piece of a puzzle that you didn't know existed. So let's get started. A fuel is a chemical substance that can react with another substance called oxidizer to release a substantial amount of energy, usually in the form of heat, so that the reaction products are released at very high temperatures. When we mix fuels and oxidizers in appropriate amounts, if at least one of the reaction products is a gas at the temperatures reached, we specifically call that mixture an explosive mixture or a propellant mixture, depending on the properties we're trying to optimize. But what makes a substance behave like a good fuel and what instead makes for a good oxidizer? To answer this question, we should start by talking about pure elements, since any other substance is made of them. The fuel or oxidizer behavior of a specific element depends on its tendency to attract electrons. The higher the tendency an element has of attracting foreign electrons, the better oxidizer it's going to be. On the other hand, if an element has a very weak attraction for electrons, it will tend to lose them, behaving as a fuel. The lower its attraction for electrons, the better the fuel. As you probably know, all of the existing elements are displayed in the periodic table, so let's give it a look and try to decide which are more promising as fuels or oxidizers. First of all, those in the rightmost column are the so-called knob gases. They have no interest in gaining or losing electrons, so for our purpose they are useless and we can ignore them. Then we note that the more we move to the right, the more interest in gaining electrons we find. So we can already say that elements on the left will be more promising as fuels, and those on the right will be more promising as oxidizers. On the other hand, going down the rows, we see a rapid increase in atomic weight. We typically want our propellant combination to be as energy dense as possible, so the heavier elements are of no interest, since they weight more without providing additional energy, and we can therefore get rid of all of the rows except for the top three. Now let's go ahead and refine this result even more. Let's first look at the oxidizers. As already said, we should look for them in the top right part, and indeed the powerful ones are only oxygen and fluorine. Fluorine is the most energetic, but working with it is a massive pain, it is highly toxic and lacks the chemical versatility of oxygen, which is the king of oxidizers and the only one used in practice. Now let's give a look at fuels. With them we have much more choice, so we need to look for what suits our needs the most. First we have to divide them in two groups, depending on whether they produce solid or gaseous combustion products. This is important because solid reaction products translate into smoke and fouling, and we usually don't want those. Sometimes we can tolerate them, sometimes we can't. Also, we will never use them on their own, since, as I said, to be a usable propellant, at least one of the reaction products needs to be a gas, otherwise we would end up with something that burns very hot, but is not able to push anything, the most common example being thermite. Only hydrogen, carbon and sulfur give gaseous reaction products, all of the others produce solids, so we'll have to keep that in mind. Anyway, to put the remaining elements head to head, I will display the energy they release when mixed with oxygen for one gram of mixture in these two tables. One for smoky fuels, the other for smokeless. In each one, we can get rid of the least energetic fuels, since there is no practical benefit in using those either. Let's therefore get rid of sulfur, sodium, silicon and phosphorus. We can already say that whenever smoke is not tolerable, for example in internal combustion engines, firearms and typically anything that has moving parts exposed to the combustion, we are going to use either carbon or hydrogen as fuel elements. If smoke is instead tolerable, as in solid rocket motors for example, we can use one of the smoky fuels as an additive to increase the heat output. But even in that case, at least one has to be removed. Beryllium is crazy expensive and highly toxic and has therefore never been used as a fuel or propellant. 
Finally, even though lithium and boron have been used in very specialized applications, they come with many problems of their own and their use is practically non-existent as fuels. Therefore, to produce a high-performance propellant or explosive, we'll have to mix hydrogen and or carbon with oxygen, possibly with the addition of magnesium or aluminum as additives. The only problem is that in elemental form, both oxygen and hydrogen are gases at room temperature, so we would end up with a very low density product, which translates into an unacceptable bulkiness and low combustion pressure. So to increase my propellant's density, both for compact storage and to reach high combustion pressure, I have four options. Compress the gases to a higher than atmospheric pressure, cool them to cryogenic temperature so that they become liquids, assemble them into larger molecules, or a combination of the three. The first approach is limited by the strength of the pressure vessel the gases are kept in, so the densities obtained are relatively low, which means that if larger storage or very high combustion pressures are needed, I'll have to find something better. In which case, a good solution is to cool the gases to cryogenic temperatures so that they become liquids. Most high-performance space rockets rely on this option, since using cryogenic propellants provides the highest possible energy density. Also, an almost nowadays forgotten class of high explosives, called oxyliquids, use a mixture of liquid oxygen and a carbon-based fuel to make for a pretty powerful high explosive. But all of these have a big drawback. They are the so-called non-storable propellants, meaning that unless actively cooled, will more or less slowly boil off and get lost. To make our propellant both high density and storable, we can use the third option. Make both fuel and oxidizer into larger molecules, so that they are liquid or solid at room temperature. This will reduce performance a little, but make the propellant much easier to work with. For fuels, the typical way to go is to bond carbon and hydrogen together to make up a hydrocarbon. Carbon is not as good as hydrogen, but it allows to store a substantial amount of heat very easily, while still contributing to the energy output. Also, I can literally make the molecule as big as I want to get my fuel liquid, solid or whatever I might need, and still need two atoms of hydrogen for every atom of carbon. Not surprisingly, hydrocarbons have been fueling humanity for the last two centuries, and will likely continue to do so. Unfortunately, with oxidizers we're going to have a lot more trouble. As said, the only practical oxidizing element is oxygen. This means that we can't bond it to any other truly useful element. With hydrocarbons, we bond it two fuels together. Hydrogen is the most appreciated, but carbon is still quite good on its own. Now, in the case of air breathing engines, the storage problem is solved by using the 21% oxygen naturally present in air, and compressing it before combustion allows reaching the desired combustion pressures. If, however, oxygen needs to be stored, or very high pressures are required, this is not possible, so either I use cryogenic liquid oxygen, or I make it into a larger molecule. As anticipated, I have no useful element to bond oxygen to, but at least I've got two that are not too bad. One is nitrogen, and the other one is chlorine. The latter is only used in composite rocket propellant, while nitrogen is by far the most used and is fundamental in making any storable explosive and gum propellant you can think of, and a lot of rocket propellants as well. So from now on, I am going to focus only on it. If we go back to the periodic table, we see that nitrogen stays exactly between fuels and oxidizers, and is typically fine on its own, being relatively inert. But we can still get it to reliably bond to oxygen, producing a family of compounds called nitrogen oxides. Needless to say, they're all good oxidizers, and are much easier to store than pure oxygen. For car guys, nitrous oxide is one of these. From that family, however, nitrogen dioxide is by far the most important. It is the one containing most oxygen, is fairly stable, and is a dark red liquid just below room temperature, meaning that it can be stored simply by putting it into a light pressurized tank. It is very commonly used in liquid propellant rockets. Whenever you see a puff of red smoke near a rocket, you are in fact looking at some vented nitrogen dioxide vapor. But this is still not practical enough for everyday use. For many applications like firearms, dealing with a low boiling liquid is far from ideal, so we should refine our chemistry a little more. I have mainly two options. Add another oxygen atom to the nitrogen to form the nitrate ion, or bond the nitrogen atom directly to the fuel molecule. Let's first go with approach number one, the nitrate ion. This one cannot exist on its own, but needs to be associated with a positive ion. In black powder, which is a very low-tech propellant, the oxygen containing nitrate ion is attached to a positive potassium ion, in the compound called potassium nitrate. That ion, however, is essentially dead weight, and here's why black powder is one of the less energetic explosives. A way to reduce the loss of performance due to the positive ion is to use one which can also act as fuel, so not to be wasted weight, the most common example being the ammonium ion. 
Ammonium nitrate is an oxidizer which already contains part of its fuel in itself and this means that propellant or explosive mixtures based on it have a pretty good specific energy. All of the other explosives you can think of are instead made by bonding the NO2 group directly to a fuel molecule. This way, for the first time, we will not be looking at an explosive mixture but at an explosive substance, since both fuel and oxidizer elements are held together in the same molecule using nitrogen as some sort of molecular glue. The process of adding NO2 groups to organic molecules is called nitration, and the selection of explosive compounds you can get with it is practically endless. However, through the years the best performing ones have been selected, and I'm going to quickly review the most used and important ones. Probably the oldest still in service explosives made this way are nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin, which are obtained by attaching NO2 groups to cellulose and glycerin molecules, respectively. The entirety of ferrum and artillery propellants from the 1890s on are nitrocellulose based, sometimes with nitroglycerin used as an additive. Also, nitroglycerin is the active ingredient in traditional dynamite. By attaching three NO2 groups to toluene, we instead get trinitrotoluene, or TNT for short, which came to market in the early 900s and is still in service today. It is so common in the field to be used as a reference for the performance of the other high explosives. Finally, during the 20s, processes for large-scale nitration of hexamine were developed, leading to the widespread production of an explosive known as RDX, which became the standard for high-performance military high explosives and has been massively used ever since, being among other things the active ingredient in C4 explosive. This video is already too long, so I won't indulge on explosives and their properties that deserve a video of their own. For now, I just want to thank again my supporters on Patreon, which are allowing this type of potentially controversial content to be produced. Thanks to the help of PromotedPwn.com, Carson Polar, Robert Jan Madri, Christopher Rush, Logan Moore and my other 10 patrons, I can keep expressing myself with freedom of speech. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more and I'll see you next time. Bye.